Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our annual joint service, Good Friday service. Now with Creek Road Bible Church, we got to get that right. Uh, we are glad everyone from both congregations could make it here. Um, just a, a little housekeeping thing for those who are new to coming to this building. Um, we have a handicap accessible bathroom back there in the foyer, and we have a men's and women's bathroom downstairs um, near the kitchen. If you walk out in the foyer and go downstairs, you'll find two bathrooms down there as well. Um, I think that's the most important thing to say before we start. Um, so I will ask you now to stand for a reading of scripture from Psalm 105 which says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered, O oh, offspring of Abraham, his servant children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Let's respond to God's word with hymn 216. Hymn 216. <laughs> Father in heaven, we 
rejoice that we have come together here as your covenant people assembled before you uh, to give you praise, to sing praise to the God of creation, to sing praise to the God of redemption who has snatched us out of the hands of death, delivering us from the pit, delivering us from our sins through the merits of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who laid down his life on that cursed tree of Calvary's cross. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you that we have this, this time now together uh, to remember that great work done on our behalf, to recall the grand narrative of salvation that culminated in the death of Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you would set our minds upon our Savior, that you would lift us to yourself in heaven as we enter your courts. Would we do so with praise? Would we do so with humility? knowing that we're coming before the very God of heaven and earth. We ask your blessing upon our time, and that you, Lord, that your name would be held high and blessed by your people this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is good to be with you tonight as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not something that took God by surprise, but rather something that has been planned uh, since time began. Our Old Testament reading today from Leviticus chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 17. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall sprinkle the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar but he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. If his offering is of the flocks, of the sheep, or of the goats, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord, and the priest, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar and he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out at the side of the altar, and he shall remove its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east side into the place for ashes. Then he shall split it at its wings, but shall not divide it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Personally, I am glad we are on this side of the cross. Uh, the New Testament reading is Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. 
For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Amen. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word this evening. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather tonight to commemorate that last sacrifice on the hill of Calvary outside of Jerusalem, Lord, we thank you for the obedience of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself on our behalf that we would have not simply atonement, but remission and removal of our sins, having paid the debt that was before us. Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for the peace that we enjoy with you because of it. And Lord, we realize the significance or, and the supreme sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Lord, may we never forget the price of our salvation. Amen. Lord, we thank you that it is free to all who believe, and yet it cost Jesus all that he had. And Lord, we pray that even as we gather tonight, as we remember his body given for us, his blood shed for us, Lord, that you would just impress upon us anew that we would truly live each day in the light of that sacrifice. And we thank you for it. In the name of our blessed Savior, Jesus, amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 John chapter 4. Our sermon text is from 1 John chapter 4. First John 4, we'll be looking at verses 7 to 12 this evening. This is God's infallible word. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for the ministry of your word 
uh, at this time that your spirit would accompany the preaching of it, that your word would be deposited in our hearts, that it would change us, uh, Lord, that we might reflect the grace, the mercy and love of our Savior who gave himself over to death on a cross for our sins. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, friends, I would say that love is by far the most prevalent concept that occupies man's thinking. How many great works of literature, uh, how many movies, how many songs revolve around the simple idea of, of two people falling in love? One of the deepest longings of the human heart, it seems, is, is to be loved and to love in return. Um, the reason we're so in love with love, the Bible says, is because God has made us this way. It's part of who we are by design. I mean, isn't that what our text says? That the, te the text says that God himself is love. And, and we know from Genesis 1 that God made us in his image, which means that, among other things, our God has created us to love, to reflect his love. We've been hardwired with this capacity to love others. You could say it's part of our spiritual DNA, so that it's impossible for you not to love. Now you'd think then that because love is so natural to us and ingrained in us that we would all be experts in this field, right? I mean, with all the talk of love, the, the fascination of love, the endless resources devoted to this subject, loving others should be relatively easy for us. But that's not the case at all, is it? You see, even though we still have the capacity to love, man's desire and his ability to love has been radically disordered by sin. Sin has polluted our thinking, it's, it's polluted our affections, it's, it's polluted our will so that our love is no longer aimed outward toward God first and foremost and, and toward our neighbor. No, our love isn't aimed outward as God originally designed it to be. Instead, our love is now aimed inward so that the person you primarily love is yourself. And even the love that we do still manage to show and express toward others, that love is still blemished by our sinful, self-centered desires. In our fallen condition, humanity does not have a true understanding of love, nor do we have the power to love the Lord and others as he originally designed us. And, and so, because of this predicament, where do, we, where do we turn to for help? Where do we go? Well, many turn to the authorities of the culture, like Hollywood, or romance novelists, and pop artists. Or they just follow the spirit of the age, which says that love is essentially about feelings, it's reduced to sexual attraction, or just affirmation. We all have heard these things before. All of this confusion in our culture about love, it testifies to the problem, doesn't it? That man is a sinner in rebellion against a holy God. And so some turn to those cultural authorities and they're led in the wrong direction. But where do you turn as a Christian? You should turn to the only infallible authority and source of truth there is, which is the word of God. God is the one who created and designed us. And so apart from his word, we'd remain lost in our sins and totally confused about the subject of love. Scripture is necessary if you're to learn the truth about love. And the Bible is sufficient so that you don't need to consult those other cultural authorities on this issue, the authorities that are so confused. On this subject, there's, there's nothing that the Bible leaves out that, that then requires you to seek answers elsewhere in another book or, or another person. No, the Lord has spoken sufficiently. He's spoken with clarity. His word is enough, and I trust that you'll see this tonight as we examine this passage in 1 John 4. 
Here the Lord lays down the foundation of love so that what's said in this text must guide our expressions of love if those expressions are to be pure and sincere and selfless. This passage teaches us about the essence of love, that it's rooted in the very nature of God. And that God has manifested his love to us in his son, Jesus Christ, who was born into this world that he might give himself as a love offering for our sins. And so if we're to know why we're to love and how we're to love, if we're to love one another as verse 7 of our text commands us, then let us look to the word of God and to the God of the word. In verses 7 and 8, the Apostle John says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And so here at the outset, John gives us, you see, one foundational reason that we're to love one another, and it's because God himself is love. Love, then, doesn't originate with us. It doesn't originate inside of you. God is the source and the fount of love. And by this, God, John just doesn't mean uh, that, that God demonstrates his love in the things that he does. That much is true. The Bible tells us over and over again about God's mighty acts of love in history. And we'll soon get to his supreme act of love in Christ. But understand that John's focus at this point isn't on God's external actions. John doesn't say God is loving. He says God is love, which means that it's the nature of God that's in view here. His nature and his character is one of love. This fact, you see, provides the basis for every legitimate expression of love in our world. Think about this. Every act of kindness every act of generosity, every act of heroism, even by unbelievers, it's possible only because the existence of the biblical God, the God who is love, only because he exists. Every ounce of love that one person shows to another is simply an imperfect reflection of God's own loving nature. Love permeates the whole of who he is because, as the Bible says, he is love. And now this profound truth that, that John tells us here is, is prone to much misunderstanding even among Christians. Okay, even though God is love, this doesn't mean that his love eclipses any of his other attributes, as if love is the most abundant of God's attributes or the most important of his attributes. Isaiah 6, for instance, says what? That God is holy, holy, holy. But that doesn't mean that his holiness is, is then greater than his love. You know, too often Christians conceive of God in, in this way that his attributes are basically parts of him so that he's like this pie that's divided up into multiple slices and there are some slices that are bigger than the others but that's not what the Bible leads us to believe about the nature of God. Just as God is love, he is each of his other attributes in infinite measure. And so while your entire hope as believers is anchored in this truth here that God is love, this doesn't give you license to ele elevate God's love above all of his other perfections. Many people are in the habit of doing this, including unbelievers. They invoke this statement here that, that God is love, and they do so to negate his holiness. Why? It's because they want to excuse their sin. And this is all, you see, it's all in keeping with the culture's warped perspective of love. According to the spirit of the age, you can't judge somebody because that's not loving. Instead, you must affirm everyone's behavior. And, and many who endorse this idea wrap it up in the Bible with this particular statement here, that God is love. I mean, who can argue with that, right? If God affirms this person, then who are you to object to that? Who are you to go against the Lord? But of course, sinners 
are highly skilled in the art of twisting scripture to justify their wickedness. We all do this, by the way. Right? This began in the garden with the father of lies who twisted God's word to achieve his evil ends, and sinners have been following in Satan's footsteps ever since that day. And friends, understand that, that a God whose love, only love, who's not also holy or just, that is a God who makes no demands of us. He's a God who tolerates sin. A God who approves of all of your choices, no matter what they are. A God who validates all of your feelings, who celebrates every expression of love, who accepts you just as you are and never wants you to change. This is a God who exists merely for our personal benefit. He's not about exclusion, but inclusion, because after all, God is love. That's the God that many people worship today in our society, but it's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God who is. That is a God of man's depraved imagination. This precious gospel-centered truth here that God is love, it has been ripped by so many from its scriptural context and, and twisted into this trump card, really, that sanctions all kinds of unbiblical beliefs and, and behaviors. For many, sadly, even many in the church, this is nothing more than a slogan used to advance man's immoral ideologies. But this is what you get when you distort a passage like ours by simply elevating one attribute, love, above the others, like holiness. What do you get? You get the justification of sin. You get the desecration of God's name and nature. And similar problems arise when you elevate God's love above his justice. Maybe you've heard others say this before, that a loving God would never send anybody to hell. He would never punish sinners eternally for their sins. A God of love would make a way for everyone to be saved, even if that way wasn't through Jesus Christ. Surely God has laid down many roads to heaven. Many roads. So that it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what religion you adhere to, as long as you were sincere. Friends, these ideas aren't on the fringe. These are mainstream Sadly, even in many churches. And so if you're to be biblical, you have to remember that none of God's attributes are in conflict. None are greater than the rest. They are all held equally together. Now, having said this, the Apostle John does focus your attention in a particular direction here on a particular attribute. He wants you, in context, the Apostle John is calling all of us to love one another, which requires you to know that God is love. That God's nature is one of love means his love doesn't have the potential for growth. Nor does God's love have the slightest possibility of ever diminishing. His love does not increase or decrease in its intensity. If you're in Christ, there is not some point in the past where, where Jesus loved you more than he does right now. He doesn't love you less when you displease him. The love he has for his people, it's always operating at limitless capacity all of the time. And so John gives you this crucial lesson here on the doctrine of God so that by better understanding who God is, you can better understand who you are and what the Lord requires of you. In other words, God's nature has ethical implications for your life. His nature is one of love, which means that's the nature inherited by all those who've been born of him. John says this very thing, whoever loves has been born of God, and he knows God. And so love is the natural fruit of the new birth. It's the evidence, says the apostle, that you've been born again by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's that necessary result of the Spirit indwelling you and giving you a new heart. Those who love like God show that they've been born of him, that they know him, which is to say that their lives are lived in constant fellowship with him. This is why John is so adamant here that in throughout the entirety of his first letter, he's so adamant that love is the chief mark of a Christian. 
Being a Christian involves much more than just intellectually agreeing with certain theological truths. It's more than just engaging in certain Christian behaviors like going to church or praying or getting baptized or taking the Lord's Supper. Those are things Christians do. They're biblical things, important things, but understand that's not what a Christian is. That's not what makes you a Christian. That's not what defines a Christian. There are people who do all of those good things, but they're not Christians because a Christian is not defined by what he does, but by the fact that he has fellowship with the Father and the Son by the Spirit. A Christian is one who says with the Apostle Paul that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's Kind of what John says here in in verse 12. He says, if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. To be a Christian is to have the very presence of God, your loving God, within you. Such that you live every moment of your life in communion with God. And so for John, the idea that you could be a Christian that you could be born again and and have God indwelling you by his spirit, but not be a loving person, for John, that's a categorical impossibility. Love as God defines it is the principal fruit of someone who's been born of him and knows him, so that if you don't love like God, then you don't know him. If you're missing the key feature that identifies you, as a spirit-filled believer, then you're not a spirit-filled believer. And and no, this doesn't mean, I know the wheels are turning, this doesn't mean that that our love is perfect, of course. We still battle remaining indwelling sin, but understand that John's point is that you can't be born of the God of love without his love affecting you and acting upon you, and influencing you, and shaping you into a more loving person. Just as children resemble their natural parents, those born of God can't help but resemble their heavenly Father. So bitterness, grudges, malice, hatred, anger, all of that defined your old self. But if you're of God, then the Bible says the old is gone, and the new has come. Love is his nature, and love is now your nature. And so love is the principle that should drive all of your interactions with one another. That's the argument that John is making. And now he gives you a a second reason that you're to love one another. Verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And so here you see the relationship between one's nature and his actions. You reveal your nature by what you do. This is true of us. It's also true of God. God's nature, his character, we've already seen, is one of love. And he's expressed his love outwardly by giving you, giving all of us, the greatest gift that could ever be given, his son, Jesus Christ. And so John first argued that that God's nature is the source of love. And now he argues that God's son is the chief expression of love. God's love is personified in Jesus Christ. The love of God descended from heaven to earth. That love took on human flesh, making Jesus the incarnation of divine love. As John puts it, the God who is love has manifested his love in his Son, whom he sent into the world so that we might have life through him. And so God's love poured out in Christ has produced eternal life for all of you who look to Jesus in faith. And now in verse 10, we learn a bit more about God's Christ-centered love for his people. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so according to John, one of the key characteristics of God's love demonstrated in Christ is that this love in Christ is unconditional. 
In other words, you've done nothing to earn his love. You've done nothing to deserve God's love. You did not work for it. God didn't reward you with this love because you are on your best behavior. He doesn't love you because you're a good person. He doesn't love you because you're committed to the church. He doesn't love you because you've obeyed his commands. He doesn't love you, John says, because you first loved him. The truth is that you haven't loved him. The truth is that we've all hated the Lord. That's what it means to be a sinner. Right? We're law breakers, and law breakers hate the law giver. Right? What's natural to sinners isn't love for God, but hatred for God. What's natural is for us to despise his commands and to love our sin. Sinners reject God's authority, and they live by their own authority. Sinners don't live for God's pleasure. They live for their own pleasure. Sinners don't love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sin has turned us inward, remember, so that the most important person in your life, the person you love more than anyone else, it's not the Lord. It's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's not your son, your daughter, your parents, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or anybody. Because of sin, the person you love the most is yourself. More than anything, we want to please and serve ourselves. And so, no, you haven't loved God. Far from it. John says there's nothing about you that causes the Lord to love you or that in any way moved him to send his son into the world for you. Because of your sin, God owes you, all of us, one thing and one thing only. And that's his wrath. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We have to be clear on this point that judgment is the only thing that sinners deserve. The justice of God, friends, demands the death of every single person in this room. That is the truth. There's nothing that you could ever do to change God's mind. Right? To say otherwise is to suggest that, that God would give us some kind of moral or, or religious checklist, and once we've done everything on the list, then, then he will overlook his justice, and then he will love us. But that turns the gospel on its head. That's a different gospel. One in which we earn God's love and essentially save ourselves. But John couldn't be clearer. Here. The Lord has freely given his love to those who can't earn it and don't deserve it. Jesus Christ is not God's gift to the worthy, but to the unworthy. Jesus is not God's response to your love. Jesus is God's gracious response to your sin. Out of the abundance of his mercy, the Father sent his Son to redeem law-breaking, God-hating rebels like you and like me, which means his love, as John says here, is absolutely and undeniably unconditional. And now, the apostle gives us another key characteristic of this divine love in Christ, which is that this love is sacrificial. God gave his son to sinners for a purpose, and that purpose was not just to show us how to live, though, though Jesus is, of course, our supreme moral example. He's the example we look to on how to love and how to lead a holy life. Well, Jesus also didn't come into the world, by the way, only to teach us, which many people believe. Even though teaching did play a prominent role in Christ's public ministry. And so while Jesus is our supreme example, while he is our supreme great teacher, he's much more than this, and we need him to be more than this, you see, because someone who is just our teacher or just an example cannot save us from the wrath of God. According to our text, God sent his son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. If you're not accustomed to using that word, it's time to make a change. 
Propitiation should be a regular part of your Christian vocabulary because it's at the very center of the Bible's understanding of the cross. Right? There's simply no atonement and no salvation without propitiation. And so what does it mean? Well, many wrongly believe that the way a loving God deals with sin is basically by ignoring it. Okay, when he forgives your sins, he essentially just pretends they never happened. He, he, he sweeps them under the rug and he says, we're not going to worry about them anymore. That's what many people think. But if that was the case, then we wouldn't need Jesus. God wouldn't have needed to send his son at all. That Jesus is the propitiation for your sins tells you that, yes, God is love, but it also reminds you of something else equally important that God is also just. The God of perfect love is also the God of perfect justice, and a just judge cannot ignore sin. Now, it's not that God just refuses to ignore sin. That's true. But it's that he can't ignore sin because his nature isn't only one of love, it's one of justice. His just nature demands that all sinners, that every person gathered here tonight, be punished. But this presents us with a dilemma. How can a just God, who must punish sinners for their hard-hearted rebellion against him, how can he, at the same time, love and forgive those sinners? His love can't override his justice. His justice can't override his love. And so how can he love you and then punish you at the same time? The answer is propitiation. Propitiation is where the love and justice of God come together. That Jesus is the propitiation for your sins means that by his death, he satisfied all the demands of God's justice on your behalf. On the cross, he served as your substitute, and he atoned for your sins. So that the judgment that you and I rightly deserve, Jesus redirected it away from us, and he invited it upon himself. He he stood between us and a holy and just God by taking that cup of wrath out of our hands, that cup that we deserve to drink. And Jesus said, no, I will take that from you. And what did he do? He drank every last drop himself. That's why Jesus said his last words. What were they? It is finished. What was finished? All of the work required to atone for our sins. And so in no way does the Lord ignore your sin or ignore his own justice. The cross is where the penalty for your sin was paid by the one who knew no sin. Jesus is the only human being to ever love the Lord with all of his heart, all of his soul, mind, and strength, and love his neighbor as himself. He's the only one who's kept the commandments of God in their entirety. He's the only one who's walked in perfect fellowship with the Father, submitting to every jot and tittle of the Father's will. And yet, because of his great love for you, God's righteous Son took the blame for you. And he was condemned on Calvary's cursed tree. Propitiation is that great gospel declaration that God punishes sinners through a substitute, through the sacrifice of his very own son, so that you who believe in Jesus, who cling to him in faith as your Savior, so that you would not come into judgment, but so that you would know and experience the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. This is what it means, friends, that God's love is sacrificial. The Father gave up his own Son, and the Son gave up his own life to reconcile you to God in a bond of eternal and unbreakable fellowship. And so you can't properly understand God's love apart from his justice. Without his justice, his love wouldn't be sacrificial. Without a penalty penalty to be paid, there wouldn't be any need for Jesus to suffer. Your your salvation rests upon God's costly love, love that's powerful enough to cover over the full multitude of your sins. And so 
there are no conditions that you need to meet. There are no hoops that you need to jump through. There are no religious works that you need to perform. There are no sins that you need to get a handle on before you can experience and know the love of God in Christ. As Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is the Savior who gave his life for undeserving sinners. And so if you don't know him, if you're here this evening and you don't know him, if you're not reconciled to your creator, the call of salvation is to simply repent of your sin and put your faith in Christ, for he is the living embodiment of God's unconditional and sacrificial love for sinners. So we spent the majority of the sermon learning these profound truths about the love of God. You've seen that God's nature is one of love and that he's expressed his love in a deeply personal way in giving his son over to death on a cross for your sins. In light of this, I want to conclude the message by returning to John's original concern in this portion of his letter. He's unpacked the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ because he has this ethical aim in mind. He's concerned about love within the body of Christ. And, and in this text, he's given us both the motivation of our love and the pattern of our love. You can think of these as the why and the how. Why are we to love one another? How are we to love one another? Both questions are answered by looking to God's love in Christ. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so why should you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Why should you love those sitting around you this evening? Why should you put up, I don't know, with difficult people in the church? Why should you be patient with those who might get under your skin? Why shouldn't you why shouldn't you hold grudges or, or harbor bitterness? Why should you be slow to anger and quick to forgive those who offend you? You don't need to mine the depths of Scripture to find the answer. It's right here in our text. You're to love your brothers and sisters in all of these ways because the Lord in his infinite mercy has loved you in Christ. And what's to be the pattern of your love? How are you to love your brothers and sisters, unconditionally and sacrificially. This means not putting conditions on your love, of course, not making others work for it, not requiring them, requiring them to jump through all of these hoops or, or to live up to your expectations before you love them. And it means not withholding your love from those you deem unworthy. Why? Because that's not how Jesus treats you. You're called to be a giving person, someone who's generous with his time and resources and willing to make sacrifices to serve others and, and to invest in them. You're, you're, you're to pattern your love off of the gospel, the gospel that you confess. Now, none of this ignores the fact that you have different relationships with different people and that you're closer to some, perhaps, than you are with others, and, and that you love people differently depending upon the context and the circumstances. Yes, we understand there are a lot of factors, there are a lot of variables that, uh, that you need to consider all these things when you try to work out this principle of love on the ground level. We get that, but the sermon is not about that. We'd be here all night if it was about that. This is about keeping the big picture in mind which is that in Christ, God has loved you, a sinner. He's loved you unconditionally. He's loved you sacrificially. And that's the love that you're called to imitate. His love for you is to shape your love for others. If you lose sight of this big picture, this is an important point. If you lose sight of this, then your love for others will die the death of a thousand qualifications. And it won't look anything like the love of Christ. You'll revert back to your default mode in which you love and serve yourself at the expense of others. 
But the good news of this text is that Jesus has saved you from that, from the, the penalty of your sin and the power of your sin. You've, you've been forgiven. You've been born again. You have eternal life and fellowship with the Lord. And you'll only love others to the degree that this gospel has captured your heart. If God has so richly loved us in his Son, then let us put away all self-centeredness, all self-righteousness, all hypocrisy. And as Ephesians says, let us be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray. Father, we are cut to the heart by this passage. Our sin is unveiled before us, Lord. We are self-centered. We are self-righteous. We are hypocrites, Lord. We claim the gospel of your unconditional and sacrificial love, and then we put so many conditions and qualifications on our love because we're so hesitant to give our love away to others, Lord. But there's a disconnect here. And so we pray that you would capture us anew with the gospel tonight, that we would look to the cross where your love was perfectly manifested, where your love, Lord, satisfied your justice, where your love was poured out in your Son who bled and suffered and died and was tormented in his body and soul so that we would know your mercy and forgiveness. Lord, ingrain this gospel in our hearts and change us by your Spirit so that we might freely give this same kind of love away to others. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn 338. And as you're finding that, would you stand with me?
You may be seated. The words of institution for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper are from 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way also He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So Jesus instituted His supper as He sat in the upper room with His disciples celebrating what would be the last Passover meal. Uh, The Passover, you remember, initiated God's plan of salvation of His people from Egypt. And this Old Covenant event was commemorated annually by a meal. But the Passover was ultimately pointing forward to Christ. The Passover lamb who was sacrificed on the cross for our sins so that God's judgment would pass over us. And so to commemorate the grand salvation event that launched us into a new covenant, Jesus instituted a new meal for his people, his supper. And the bread and the cup before you are signs that point to his broken body and his shed blood, without which we would have no forgiveness of sins. Now understand that these common elements, they don't transform in any way into the physical body and blood of our Savior. They remain ordinary bread and, wine, bread and, and, and juice, and yet this doesn't take away from the fact that something supernatural does occur here as we come to the table of the Lord together, and as Jesus meets us here as the host of this meal. Just as bread and wine nourish you physically, this meal nourishes you spiritually. As you eat in faith, looking to the cross, claiming Christ's death for yourself, the Spirit assures you that all of your sins have been washed away. By this visible pledge, He confirms that you've been judged in Christ, that your judgment was at Calvary's cross. He confirms to you that you belong to Him and that you therefore stand before God clothed in the blood and righteousness of the Lamb. And as Jesus renews His promises to us in this meal, He also calls us to renew our promises and our vows to Him. When you partake, you're not only claiming the Gospel, in other words, but you're also claiming those responsibilities that come with the Gospel. You're claiming all of the obligations that God has placed upon you as a believer. Now what responsibility does a disciple of Jesus have? Well, the Bible tells us we're to forsake our sin, and walk with our Savior and Lord in humility. The Spirit uses this meal to strengthen you to this end so that you would stand firm and stand strong against the world and the flesh and the devil. And so come to this meal tonight expecting God to use it in your life, to nourish you so that you would love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as a minister, I invite all who are right with the Lord, to come to this table. And so this means that if you're trusting in Jesus for your salvation, if you've been baptized and professed your faith in a Christian church, then this supper is for you. But while blessing accompanies this meal, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians, as you heard, that that judgment also accompanies this meal for those who partake in an unworthy manner. That means that this supper is for the church. It's for those who believe the gospel, who've identified themselves as Christians through baptism and through a profession of faith. And so, if this doesn't describe you, then when the bread and cup come to you, just simply pass them to the person next to you. But for you who do belong to Jesus, know that this meal is for unworthy sinners, which we all are. And nobody comes to this table perfect, free from the struggle of sin. And so, 
If you're in need of spiritual strength, if you're in need of comfort and encouragement and growth in grace, then Jesus invites you to his table to come eat and be nourished in him. As we come to the table, as Jesus gave thanks, let us give thanks as well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we ponder your love for us, we are reminded that tonight even that your love transcends ours. And that true love is not because we love you, but because you love us and gave yourself. Thank <laughs> you. 
part of the death, not simply of our depravity, but of the price that Jesus paid for our sin. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us. Not simply that, the fact that you are love. Lord, may we emulate uh, Jesus throughout our day, each and every day, walking in the light of the gospel that transforms us into the very image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. As we close, the question is taken in those once again. In number 276, Jesus made it all. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to come together, to come together as like-minded believers, Amen. to commemorate the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died not simply a martyr's death, but died the sacrifice for our sins. And Lord, we pray that as we leave this place tonight, you would impress upon us anew the price of our salvation that we would allow it to motivate us to be more like him. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.